So we're gonna, we got a special assignment this morning. We're going to be talking about uh, prayer. And uh, let me fix this thing real quick so I don't drop it. Uh, can't think about uh, a more fitting subject to not only talk about in church, but especially today as we celebrate uh, Pentecost uh, Sunday. And I want to start just by asking you a very simple, straightforward question. What do you think about when you hear the word prayer? What comes to mind when somebody brings up the subject of prayer for you? All of us have different backgrounds and experiences, and so there's probably a lot of different ways that we would describe prayer. But most of us probably share one common perspective about prayer, and that would be that prayer is something we do when we're faced with a difficult decision or a challenging circumstance. Prayer is something we do when we're faced with a difficult decision or a challenging circumstance. When we don't know what to do or how we're going to get through, pray and ask God for help. When we don't know what to do or how we're going to get through, pray and ask God for help. In fact, if we were to poll the room, many of us could probably give examples of times when we were faced with a difficult decision or, or going through a challenging circumstance and we prayed and asked God for help and we believed that God uh, answered us by giving us wisdom and guidance or even miraculously intervening in our life. And some of you today are probably actually in situations right now where you are desperately seeking God's guidance and intervention in prayer. There is absolutely nothing wrong with seeking God's help through prayer. In fact, when we need help, God is actually probably the best person for us to ask. The challenge is that if we're honest, many of us only pray, primarily pray, when we are in need. We don't pray on a regular basis because we, quote, don't need something. So we wait until we need something to pray. In reality, prayer should be an active part of our daily lives as Christians. The Apostle Paul actually tells us to pray without ceasing, meaning prayer is actually something that we do, but it's also a lifestyle. We should be living a lifestyle of prayer. The fact that many of us don't pray on a daily or even regular basis not only demonstrates an immaturity on our part, but also that we may not fully understand the privilege that is prayer. So today, in an effort to both challenge and inspire us to make prayer a part of our daily lives, to make prayer our lifestyle, we are going to look at one of the most famous examples of prayer, commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer from Matthew 6, verse 5 to 15. Matthew 6, 5 to 15 says this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your father, your father, knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, before we go uh, into the text in detail, I want to just reaffirm something. Everything we just read was spoken by Jesus. These are letters in red, which means that what we just read was Jesus' perspective on prayer. The word most frequently translated prayer in the New Testament, which is used here, means to express our desires toward heaven or toward God. So prayer is expressing our desires toward God in heaven. And in this text in, in uh, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, as he often does, is the hallmark of his teaching, refers to God as your father or our father. 
And this distinction, using the term Father instead of God, means that Jesus saw prayer as one of the ways we relate to God as our Heavenly Father. Jesus saw prayer as one of the ways we relate to God as our Heavenly Father. From Jesus' perspective, we are not just praying to a remote deity in a faraway place, but we are praying to a Heavenly Father who sees us and cares about us. Prayer, in the view of Jesus, is not only the act of expressing our desires to God, but also a means by which we accept God's invitation to meet with him and know him closely, more intimately, as a heavenly father. Prayer is not only the act of expressing our desires toward God, but also a means by which we accept God's invitation to meet with him and to know him more intimately as a father. John 1, 12 to 13 says this, John 1, 12 to 13, but to all who did receive him, talking about Jesus, who believed in his name, <clears throat> he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We are God's children. When we re legitimately receive Jesus through faith in his name, the Lord is salvation. We are reborn as children of God. This means that we have a newfound sense of origin, identity, and purpose in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. We are His children. Jesus describes prayer as one of the means by which we meet with our Heavenly Father in order to grow in a closer, more intimate relationship with Him. So what does it look like to have a close, intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father? I'll give you a practical example. After a couple of years of uh, working two full-time jobs, by the grace of God, the grace of God and maybe the skin of my teeth, I was able to transition to a place where I'm working one full-time job instead of two, and now I'm actually working remotely from home. So my wife and kids went from not seeing me a whole lot to now they're sick of seeing me. Uh, and my youngest boy, who's uh, seven now, had the sweetest reaction to suddenly having his dad at home. Every morning when he wakes up, he searches through the house, and when he finds me, he runs and jumps into my arms to tell me good morning that he loves me. And that's how I start every day. My littlest boy running to me, telling me that he loves me and jumping in my arms. And in that moment where I'm holding my son, all of the sacrifices that I have made to provide for him, all the sacrifices that I am making and will make to provide for him and let him know that he is safe and loved in my presence, are worth it to have that special moment with him. That is a prophetic picture of prayer. In prayer, our Heavenly Father is holding us in his arms, and we experience the provision, the safety, and the love that only comes as a result of spending time in his pre presence. God wants you to know him closely, intimately, as your Heavenly Father. The title of this morning's message is, Prayer is an Invitation to Intimacy. Prayer is an Invitation to Intimacy. Going back to our text and looking at the first verse, verse 5, Matthew 6, verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. The first thing Jesus tells us about prayer, <coughs> excuse me, is that praying in front of other people for the explicit purpose of getting them to perceive us as pious or godly is hypocritical. Praying in front of others for the exclusive purpose of getting others to see us as pious or godly is hypocritical. God is the only one uh, deserving of praise and he does not share his glory with anyone. So whether we're at the dinner table, in a small group setting, or on stage, praying with a hidden agenda only serves to reveal our own hypocrisy. Seeking to glorify ourselves is idolatry, even if we do so through the guise of prayer. Amen? There is also a serious warning here from Jesus. And that's that in praying in order to gain public recognition, 
we also limit the scope of our reward. Praying in order to gain public recognition also limits the scope of our reward. Our reward is not only limited to the accolades, the attaboys that we get from others, but we are actually precluding ourselves from receiving an even better reward from God. God is eternal and his reward is eternal. On the other hand, people's interest in us is generally fleeting. It's temporary, especially when it's based on false pretenses. This means that the manipulative use of prayer, public prayer, to gain notoriety for ourselves not only limits our reward, but it may actually cost us more than we gain. It may actually cost us more than we gain. Now, it's important to note that Jesus here is not forbidding public prayer. He is warning us not to pray publicly for the wrong reasons. Jesus' model prayer, which we'll get into in verse 10 to 13, actually switches from a singular tense, you and yours, to a plural tense, us and ours, meaning that the model prayer may actually have been intended for corporate or even public use. So Jesus does not say, don't pray in public. What he says is, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the hypocrites. Continuing in verse 6. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. So if praying hypocritical prayers is wrong, then what is the right way to pray? Jesus gets specific in his instruction to us. Prayer, first and foremost, <clears throat> should be something that we do in a private setting. First and foremost should be something that we do in a private setting. Our Father, who is in secret, meets with us in the private place of prayer. Praying to God in private is also an act of faith. The decision to pray privately means that we believe that God exists, that he wants to be close to us, and that he rewards those who seek him. Even when we pray privately, God still sees us and will reward us. The ultimate reward of prayer is that as we sincerely call out to God in prayer, we experience a closer, more intimate relationship with him. Psalm 145, 18 says it this way. Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He is near. Here is what Jesus is teaching us about prayer. And I want you to catch this. Our world doesn't need phony, fake Christians promoting themselves through phony, fake prayers. Our world needs Christians who have encountered their Heavenly Father in prayer and are so deeply impacted by their relationship with Him that they've decided to abandon the phony and the fake. Our world needs Christians who pray like one moment with our Heavenly Father is better than a thousand elsewhere. Our world desperately needs Christians who have accepted the invite and as a result, have given themselves over to the mission of invitation. Our first point of application this morning, prayer is an invitation to intimacy. As a result, prayer is predominantly private. Prayer is predominantly private. Going back to our text and picking up in verse 7 to 8, Matthew 6, 7 to 8, Jesus continues. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before, before you ask him. So once we understand that prayer is a predominantly private exchange with our Heavenly Father, it not only changes why we pray, it also changes how we pray. Not only changes why we pray, it also changes how we pray. Praying to God our Father means that we don't have to use catchphrases 
religious jargon or repeat the same prayer multiple times in order to get God to take notice. He's our father. He notices. Our heavenly father sees us and knows what we need before we ever even ask him. When we pray, we are not informing God of something new. In prayer, we are responding to the active interest of a father who is aware of our needs, cares for us, and desires to be involved in our lives. Prayer is a relationship. Prayer is a relationship. Jesus, talking about how to pray, goes on in verse 9 to 10. Matthew 6, 9 to 10. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus gives us this model prayer. And in this model prayer, he asserts that when we pray, we are praying to our Father who is enthroned in heaven. Our Father in heaven. While we approach his throne, confidently trusting that we, God will receive us as our Father, this does not negate our need to approach him with respect and humility. It does not negate our need to approach him with respect and humility. Our Father, our Heavenly Father, is not like other fathers. Meeting with our Father in prayer involves reverently entering the throne room of heaven and being received with grace. The two things, entering reverently and being received with grace, are not mutually exclusive. That's why his throne is called a throne of grace. Our Father, our Father in heaven. Jesus also states this, our Father's name is hallowed, sacred, or holy. His name is exalted above others. This means that when we pray, when we call on his name in prayer, we should also do so with reverence. Our relationship with our Heavenly Father does not give us license to flippantly use his name in prayer. His name is holy, and we should treat it that way. His name is holy, and we should treat it that way. When we pray, Jesus instructs us to ask for God's will to be done and for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. By praying in this manner, we are expressing our allegiance to God's will and to his kingdom. We are expressing our allegiance to God's will and his kingdom. We are also inherently making ourselves available to be a part of God's redemptive plan on earth as it is in heaven. As we enter into an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father through prayer, we must choose where our allegiance lies and whose will we are living for. As we enter into an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father through prayer, we must choose where our allegiance lies and whose will we are living for. Prayer is reverent. Prayer is reverent. It's so important for us to pray with the right posture before God. Why? Our world doesn't need Christians flippantly using God's name in prayers that demonstrate selfish and questionable motives. Our world needs Christians who through prayer have encountered their heavenly father enthroned in heaven. Our world needs Christians so marked by a prayerful relationship with God that they revere his holy name and swear exclusive allegiance to him alone. Exclusive allegiance to him alone. Our world needs Christians who are praying for God's kingdom to come and for God's will to be done. Our world needs Christians who are modeling heaven through their prayers. Heaven being a place where every knee bows and every tongue confesses his lordship. Our second point of application this morning, prayer is an invitation to intimacy. As a result, prayer is relational and reverent. Prayer is relational and reverent. Going on to our text, uh, verse 11 to 12. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. We should really take note here of the phrases this day and daily bread. Prayer should be something that we practice every single day. Every day we should take God up on his invitation to meet with him in the private place of prayer. When we ask God to give us our daily bread, our daily sustenance, we are also acknowledging daily that God is our provider. In the same way that a child should be able to wake up daily trusting their father to provide for them, we too can wake up daily trusting God to provide for us. Daily provision is requested through prayer. Daily trust is also expressed through prayer. Daily provision is requested through prayer. Daily trust is also expressed through prayer. Now this phrase, daily bread, may be an allusion to the manna, the bread from heaven, which God miraculously provided for the children of Israel when they were wandering in the desert. What is critical for us to recognize is that God not only provides for our material needs, but also our immaterial needs. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Ultimately, it is God himself through Christ that is our daily sustenance, our daily bread. Jesus says this in John 6.35. John 6.35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. It is God himself through Christ who is our daily sustenance, our daily bread. Jesus goes on to talk about forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. In prayer, we also ask our Heavenly Father for, to forgive us and, and to help us forgive others. Forgiveness is something we receive and something we give. Forgiveness is something we receive and something we give. And both the receiving and the giving of forgiveness start in prayer. Think about it. Our sin left us with a debt that we could never repay, spiritually bankrupt before God. Christ paid our debt on the cross. If God, through the atoning sacrifice of Christ, is willing and able to forgive us our sins, we should be willing and able to forgive others of any debt that we feel they owe us. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Picking up in verse 13, Matthew 6, 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So let's be clear about what Jesus is saying here. God does not tempt anyone to sin. Scripture makes it clear that God is not the cause of temptation and he is not susceptible to temptation. Now there was a time when Jesus was led by the Spirit into a place where he was tempted or tested by the devil. You can read about it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. The tempter, though, was the devil. The purpose of this was to demonstrate Jesus' authority over the devil and over sin. As he refused temptation, he was demonstrating his authority over the devil and over sin. This also venerated Jesus as a reliable an empathetic source of help when we are faced with temptation. Jesus, in literally being confronted by the devil, suffered greater temptation than anything we will ever experience, and that means he is able to help those who are being tempted. We, on the other hand, are not Jesus. Somebody gently nudge your spouse. We should pray for God's help in avoiding temptation. We should pray for God's help in avoiding temptation. Lead us not into temptation. God, our Heavenly Father, will not allow us to be tempted beyond our ability, 
But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that we may be able to endure it. Jesus here instructs us to use prayer as a means of avoiding temptation. When we are confronted by evil, the best thing we can do is stay in an intimate, close relationship with our Heavenly Father through prayer. It's like holding your dad's hand when you're walking across a busy street. In prayer, we can and should ask for God's help to overcome temptation. In fact, being watchful in prayer prepares us to refuse temptation. Matthew 26, 41, this is Jesus talking. He says, Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. <clears throat> so being watchful in prayer prepares us to refuse temptation. And here's the critical takeaway. A genuine request for God's forgiveness should also be followed by an earnest effort to avoid the sin we just asked God to forgive. If our request for forgiveness isn't followed by a legitimate attempt to stop succumbing to the temptation, our request for forgiveness is disingenuous, and while we may be remorseful, we are not truly or fully repentant. Jesus sets us free from condemnation, and then he tells us, go and don't sin anymore. Through prayer, we are fortified against temptation and evil. Moving on to verse 14 and 15. Matthew 6, 14 to 15. <clears throat> For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Ouch. There is a difference between a command and a suggestion. God commands us to forgive others when we pray. This means that if we refuse to forgive, we are actually disobeying God's command and therefore are sinning. To put it in perspective, if we use someone else's sin as a justification for refusing to forgive them, God will apply that same standard to us. And the awful irony is that by disobeying God's command to forgive, we are actually sinning, making us just as guilty of sin as the person we are refusing to forgive. If we use someone else's sin as a justification for refusing to forgive them, God will apply that same standard to us. But think about this. God sees us as his children. He's our heavenly father. So here's why this is really so important. Forgiving others in prayer protects us from the terrible bitterness that unforgiveness causes. Forgiving others in prayer protects us from the terrible bitterness that unforgiveness causes. As long as we refuse to forgive someone else, we are still being adversely affected by the sin that they committed, with the notable exception that we are now choosing the harm by refusing to forgive. Worst of all, as Hebrew 12 warns us, the root of bitterness caused by unforgiveness robs us of the greatest benefit of grace, and that's the ability to share it with others. It can also cause us to harm others as it introduces trouble and contaminates all of our relationships. <clears throat> now we have to pause here for a moment because some of us have suffered some serious wrongs at the hands of other people. God uniquely understands the horrible injury that can be caused by someone else's sin. In asking us to forgive others, God is not downplaying. He's not downplaying the harm that other people have caused us. Think about that picture of Jesus dying on the cross for other people's sin. God uniquely understands the horrible injury that can be caused by someone else's sin. But here's why God is asking us to forgive others. God 
as our Heavenly Father wants to free us from the influence and control of other people's sin. God, as our Heavenly Father, wants to free us from the influence and control of other people's sin. So we talked about how God wants to free us from the influence and control of our own sin. God also wants to free us from the influence and control of other people's sin. And he knows that the only way this can truly happen is for us to choose to forgive. He knows that the only way this can happen is for us to choose to forgive. Entering into an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father through prayer will drive us to jettison unforgiveness and bitterness in the same way that it drives us to forsake temptation and evil. Prayer in this way fortifies us against unforgiveness and the bitterness that it causes. Why is it so important for us to resist temptation and pursue forgiveness in prayer? Our world doesn't need Christians who love sin more than they love their Heavenly Father. Our world needs Christians who so deeply love their Heavenly Father that they've decided to abandon their sin and prayerfully go to, way, to war against any temptation that attempts to lure them away from God's presence. Our world needs Christians that value the presence of God that they've experienced in prayer more than they value the, their right to hate the people that have hurt them. I'm going to say that again. Our world needs Christians that value the presence of God that they've experienced in prayer more than they value their right to hate the people that have hurt them. Our world needs Christians who believe that God is the answer to their prayers. Our world needs Christians who believe that God is the answer to their prayers. Third and final point of application this morning, prayer is an invitation to intimacy. As a result, prayer is forgiving and fortifying. Prayer is forgiving and fortifying. Now the world, the flesh, and the devil are working diligently to assert the lie that we are their children and that we belong to them. We need to refute this lie and reinforce the truth by spending time with our Heavenly Father in prayer. It's an issue of paternity. So why is prayer so important? We just looked at Jesus himself giving us his perspective on prayer. And here's what Jesus has said to us. God isn't a remote deity in a faraway place. We are God's children. He is our father. And he wants us to know him and relate to him as a heavenly father. One of the most significant ways this happens is through prayer. Letters in red. God is a good father. He sees us and he wants to meet with us, to spend time with us in the private place of prayer. So when we reduce our time in prayer to only praying in the moments where we need something, we are actually neglecting our relationship with our Heavenly Father. It also means that we are disconnecting ourselves from our source of origin, identity, and purpose. We're disconnecting ourselves from our sense of, from our source of origin, identity, and purpose. The other consequence when we choose to neglect that prayerful relationship with God is that in failing to prayerfully swear allegiance to him, we almost always end up giving our allegiance to someone or something else. In failing to prayerfully swear our allegiance to him, we almost always end up giving our allegiance to someone or something else. Your heavenly father is inviting you to daily meet with him and grow in a closer more intimate relationship with him in the private place of prayer. Now, when you receive an invitation, it is considered a privilege and you are expected to respond. But this isn't an ordinary invitation from an ordinary person. God has extended an invitation to us <clears throat> by sending his son, Jesus. Jesus took the punishment for our sins on the cross, trading places with us, so that we in turn could become God's children. 
That means that this invitation is the greatest privilege that has ever been extended to anyone. This invitation is the greatest privilege that anyone has ever been extended. So the question is, God is inviting you to meet with him in the private place of prayer. The question is, will you decline the invite or will you choose to accept his invitation?